Hello and welcome to Let the Stone Speak. I'm Brent Nachtigal, your host, coming to you today from Jerusalem, Israel, from the offices of the Armstrong Institute of Biblical Archaeology. This is a podcast, if this is the first time you're joining us, where we talk about the latest in biblical archaeology, and we also have many interviews with archaeologists and scientists over here. For today's program, you're stuck with just me. I'm going to be commenting on a discovery that was made uh, on the eve of Purim and then retracted, and we'll be talking about a bit of the hoopla uh, surrounding this, and I'll add some thoughts uh, to it just so you can see some of my perspective regarding this. Before we get into this interesting uh, situation, Uh, in the biblical archaeology world over here. Uh, I would like to mention our magazine. This is called Let the Stone Speak. This is available uh, for you for free. You can get a physical hard copy of this, a free subscription. Uh, The latest edition is about Abraham's Jerusalem, goes into several articles about the archaeology of Jerusalem from this period, as well as uh, some more historical and biblical Um, discussion about Abraham and the dating of Abraham's life and a few other things as well. So if you want to receive your free subscription of this, you can uh, write to letters at armstronginstitute.org. This will make sure that you email me and we can sign you up for the magazine. Again, it's free. Or you can go to our website, armstronginstitute.org, and you can uh, just scroll down and you'll find a place where you can sign up uh, for this free magazine. Uh, So I do want to talk about this very interesting uh, discovery that was retracted, released first of all by the Israel Antiquities Authority. We had an article about this up when it came out uh, on our website, armstronginstitute.org. We have since uh, taken it down just because it was proven to be um, uh, not necessarily a fake, if we can put it that way, but it was inaccurate. It It wasn't what it was purported to be. So there has been a lot of backlash on this from the Israeli media that I think it's quite surprising um, the way that they've kind of come out swinging in many ways against the Israel Antiquities Authority. The Israel Antiquities Authority, they are in charge of giving licenses out for excavations. They're also an academic institution themselves publishing Um, scientific papers and periodicals, and they are conducting, I would say, most of the excavations in Israel. They're not necessarily affiliated with a university, although every one of their archaeologists are are trained archaeologists in different universities throughout Israel and the world. So they're they're extremely reputable. And what happened regarding uh, a... They are the Israeli governing body, basically, that... um, it oversees archaeological projects. They're, they're kind of coming in to make sure that the job is done well, that the archaeologists themselves, even if they're not employed by the IAA, um, that they're excavating in the right manner uh, and so on. And so some discoveries are brought to the pu- eye of the public based purely from the Antiquities Authority, not in conjunction with an expedition to a certain uh, a certain area or a certain, uh, whole, uh, a certain tell or a certain excavation site. And this was one of those. This was a, came directly from the Antiquities Authority, released out to the press um, because it was a chance find. These are discoveries that are made oftentimes by public, oftentimes by hikers, oftentimes by children, um, or anyone basically going along the land of Israel. If you've been to Israel and you've walked along an archaeological site, you will see mounds of pottery and other artifacts on the on the site. And it's tempting to pick something up and take it with you, which is not allowed. Um, but if there is, if you're walking along and you find something significant, more than just a piece of pottery, perhaps an inscription, as was found here, then you would then go take it to the Antiquities Authority or, or better yet, uh, find a contact, call somebody, uh, let them know the exact precise uh, find spot of what you found as you were walking along. There was another discovery this week of something that was kind of discovered in this same manner. So back in December, there were a couple of individuals that were hiking around one of the ancient sites. This is the site of Lachish, uh, which is basically between here and the Philistine coast, uh, uh, Gaza. Um, This is a massive mound that has a rich history of thousands of years. Um, And they found, uh, as they were walking, a, a, a piece of pottery that was inscribed with ancient writing on it. And, you know, this is what you're looking for in archaeology, written documents. 
And so these two weren't necessarily archaeologists, but they knew it was important. They knew it was significant enough to pick up and, and give it to the antiquities authority. So no sin there. This was good. This is what they should have done. So they deliver it to the antiquities authority. And then the antiquities authority takes it and they study it to make sure it's, it's authentic. So is it found in an ancient site? Yes. Um, is it the pottery itself ancient? So they did a series of tests on the pottery to make sure that the pottery was ancient. Indeed, it was. Um, and then they put, gave it to an epigrapher, as somebody that would look at the, the style of writing to try and decipher both from the style of writing when it was written um, and then decipher it. What does it say? And so this is what they did. They went ahead and they uh, read it. And it said something very interesting. I'll just read from the original press release that they uh, sent out. This is from the Antiquities Authority. It's entitled, First Discovery in Israel, a rare inscription bearing the name of the Persian King Darius or Darius the Great, the father of King Ahasuerus. And he is the um, uh, King Xerxes, if we can put it that way. Uh, known to history and Xerxes of course is the is the one that's related to Esther and the story of Purim and so this is kind of what they were um, why this discovery was released at this time they found in December did some tests held off to the eve of Purim and put it out at that point now if there's any sin I would say or any mistake of the antiquities authority this is probably it it is releasing or holding on to a discovery, keeping a discovery from the public until there is a specific holiday or Jewish holiday that comes up that would relate to the discovery to make it kind of more impactful. Uh, it's my opinion and, and that if you find something very significant and you, you're sure of it and you do tests on it, release it. Release it uh, there and then because then it doesn't add to the kind of gimmick feeling of archaeological discoveries. However, that's just a minor point. They released this discovery and it has uh, written on it, year 24 of Darius. Year 24 of Darius. And this would be the first time that Darius has been found on an archaeological or on an ancient artifact here in, in uh, the area of Israel from this time. Uh, this was a leader, an emperor of the Persian Empire. Um, going back, starting in 522, going all the way through to 486 BCE. So this is a significant discovery um, because we just haven't found something mentioning his name uh, before. So this gets released. Everyone's writing stories about it. We're writing stories about it. We'll talk about our story in a little bit here. Um, but then it comes out that somebody else read one of these stories, somebody very significant. It turns out that somebody the previous summer a good four or five months before this pot shirt was picked up off the ground by our hiker friends, um, that this was a, an expert that was there at the site excavating at Lachish, and she was teaching her, her students or the people with her how uh, ancient uh, Ostraca, Ostraca were made, how you'd have a pot shirt, you put writing on it, and then this would be this could be used for an official document, uh, save paper, I guess, and you know it's going to last for a long time. And she knows how to write in the language of the time, in Aramaic, um, uh, in Aramaic script, which they were using at this period. And so she writes, scribbles on it, year 24, I think it was, year 24 of, of King Darius, or Darius. And then she has her explanation, this is how they do it. And then she leaves it there. She left it there on the site. And then the, come, the rains come eventually, and we have two hikers coming around and they find this piece of pottery on the site and they are like, wow, this is amazing. So then they give it to the Antiquities Authority. And up to this point, the Antiquities Authority has no reason to believe that it's inauthentic. Of course, it was not found in the right layer. It was found on top of the towel. But a lot of, a lot of famous authentic discoveries are found perhaps out of context in secondary use outside of the time that it was written and deposited there. And so that's not necessarily a reason to deny it. It was also written on uh, a, a vessel or a shard itself that could not have been discounted uh, from the Persian period. So you, you had a possible Persian period piece 
and the Persians, obviously we call it the Persian period from when uh, the Persians were in control of the area. You have a site that was occupied definitely during the Persian period, a Persian period piece of pottery with writing from that time period, at least the style based on this expert uh, or, uh, epigrapher that put it on there, um, found at this site. And so it goes for all the testing and the pottery checks out and the writing style checks out. And so the Israeli Antiquities Authority comes out with it. Then this lady that made the mistake is very, obviously this would be, this would be just the worst feeling ever. The worst feeling to recognize that the world is writing about a piece of pottery that is supposedly 2,500 years old that you wrote four or five months ago. And what do you do at that point? Now, I think what could have been focused on in this story is rather than, as the Jerusalem Post go, get, goes into, kind of discrediting Israel or science or the archaeological community, this is a, a story of archaeological humility. And if ever we need anything in the scientific community, uh, what we need more of is archaeological and scientific humility. And that's what we find. We find that the person that wrote it told the Antiquities Authority. They said, sorry, my mistake. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have you know, written on this, or I should have told somebody, or I should have handed it off somewhere else, not just put it back down at the excavation site. And then we have her coming forward, telling the Antiquities Authority. And then the Antiquities Authority... You know, try then coming forward and saying, whoops, we made a big mistake and we take full, uh, full blame for it. However, that's not the lesson that is focused on by the Israeli press. There is two articles I just want to mention. One's an actual editorial from the Jerusalem Post. It's entitled Israeli Antiquities Authority Must Reign in Enthusiasm Before Its Next Find. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, first of all, let's just establish that this has never, ever, ever happened before. Ever, ever, if I haven't said that enough. It's never happened before that a find has come forward in this manner and the Antiquities Authority had to come back and retract the story. So this has never happened before, but that's all it took. One mistake, one mistake, and then the humility to come forward. We made, said we make a mistake, not good enough. The Israeli Antiquities Authority must rein in enthusiasm before its next find, is what they write. The... Haaretz, they wrote an initial article about it, not really talking about how sensational it was, but it was a great find. And then they come back and they write this. This is the headline, The Darius Effect. How did we get from discovery of the decade to disgrace? <laughs> this is disgraceful. I don't know whether that was the author here that wrote that headline or it was the editorial department that wrote that headline, but wow, there's no disgrace here for one. And discovery of the decade, like, come on, I could name five discoveries from the past year that were more important than some random shirt with the name of Darius on it. It's not like we didn't know that Darius was a historical personality outside the Bible. I mean, we have the Behistun inscription, this massive, uh, I forget how big it is. It's absolutely huge inscription on a wall uh, up on a cliff uh, in northern Mesopotamia, or not near Assyria. Um, we have numerous other discoveries written in his name, documents themselves, one I'll talk about. So we know that this is a real historical figure. So we found Darius on a piece of writing in the land of Israel. Important, but find of the decade? Really? This is just, you know, the media. Um, how did we get from discovery of the decade to disgrace? So if you read this, and this was the first one you read, article about it, I apologize to burst the bubble, this was not discovery of the decade at all. No serious person um, understanding the biblical archaeology world would write this headline um, unless they were just after uh, clickbait or something like that. Um, uh, one other, uh, should I comment on this article a little bit more? Um, Gideon Avni, who is the chief scientist for the Israeli Antiquities Authority, he wrote basically the apology letter. Um, it was really good. And it, it discussed, you know, how this was a mistake. We need to be careful 
Um, he he showed how this was just the perfect storm of 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 coincidences and pro and that led to this. How this is so rare, how it's never happened before, and so on. And yet they did take uh, responsibility for it, which I which I said before was just a great um, a great a bit of scientific humility. But I do want to just comment on a couple of things from this Israeli and from the Jerusalem Post piece, because. You know, if, if you're in the media, you know that one of the biggest money earners for your paper and for your news site, whether it's Times of Israel, Jerusalem Post, Haaretz, you know, go to that, those sites. And there should be a bar somewhere on the side that says most listened to, most watched, most read article. And if there's been an archaeological discovery in the past week that's got a biblical significance especially, that is number one. It sits there. The amount of revenue that media, and this is why they all have an archaeology correspondent, is because it gets clicks. It gets so many clicks. Yes, it's important, but wow, this is a money earner for the journalists and the news companies in Israel and the world, I would say. And so, you know, they're, they love the archaeologists. <laughs> most of the time and yet they make one mistake the IA makes one mistake and it's like pile on oh they're horrible listen to this from the Jerusalem Post and, and they I'm not saying it's all negative from the Jerusalem Post um, but they do make a couple of statements that I think are just a little uncalled for we are pleased that the IA took the incident seriously and is intent on preventing a repetition of such an embarrassing mistake. It is not only the credibility of the National Antiquities Authority that's at stake, but also the credibility of the country itself. I don't know if you realize that, that the credibility of Israel is at stake based on a mistake um, here by the Antiquities Authority. Such cases cast, cast doubts on all other dramatic findings, particularly those released for specific festivals. Now, I will say again, perhaps it's best to release a find as soon as it comes out rather than hold off for a great, you know, because obviously the Antiquities Authority cares about press as well. More press eventually means more donations. And so, you know, you understand the reasons why they might do that. So that, that would be one bit of learning for them. Um, then they write, there is a plethora of genuine, exciting archaeological findings relating to all the different eras represented in this region. Uh, the IAA must curb its enthusiasm and double and triple check its findings before publications. Unfounded stories about ancient artifacts should remain buried. Well, they did double and triple check it. I don't know really how much more they could have done about this. Of course, you know, there is an element of, of unprovenanced artifacts, meaning that didn't come from the right layer in a controlled scientific excavation. So we do need to treat it with a little bit of caution. Of course, that's the case. However, I, what do you do in this case? Do you keep it from the public? Um, just because it was, you know, found on the surface of an ancient tell, which is which does have that error there, which is found in the right location. Anyway, uh, we won't go into that necessarily. But this says that it's not only the the credibility of the nation, National Antiquities Authority that's at stake, but also the credibility of the country itself. I would again say that's wrong. I would say that if you have a country that's so so keen on proving the Bible correct. They don't come forward so fast and make an apology like this. They hold it back. And we've seen this everywhere over the rest of the media, places where they write a story, they take it as fact, and then they need to come back and correct the story. So do they give a new press release about how the story was wrong? Or do they add a little editorial note right at the little bottom that nobody reads and said, oh, actually that fact was wrong. That's where they put it. And here was the Antiquities Authority that came out and just gave another press release and basically said, we're, we're sorry, this was an accident. Now, does it, considering that they're willing to do that for this find, that only bolsters the strong archaeological claims that have been made about the significance of other finds. I'm reminded of, of when 
uh, the late Dr. Elotmazar were excavating with her back in 2007, and she releases a discovery of a reading of a, of a seal impression, actually from the same time period, maybe about 40 years after, uh, in the Persian uh, seal itself. Um, and she said that, you know, this is, look, it's got some type of figurines on it, and then it says Temech at the bottom, and this name is important because of this, this, and the other reason. And some epigrapher came and said to her, well, actually, I think you're reading it the wrong way. For whatever reason, it actually says Shlomit or something like that. And as a good scientist, you welcome the feedback. You say, you don't double down and if you're wrong. You say, sorry, I made a mistake. Thank you for contributing to the truth, to know knowledge. And so, as I said, again, this is something I think that... Um, we need more of in the scientific community is some of the humility and the media could learn from this as well, have a little bit of humility when it comes to reporting and, and correcting mistakes uh, when they are made. And again, I don't know how the antiquities authority does more uh, to, to try and test this before it came forward. Um, but they did issue a wonderful apology, and if, in my opinion, that adds credibility to the Antiquities Authority. It does not take it away. Now, I will say a couple of things about this press release and about the reporting of this discovery, which indicates to me that the Antiquities Authority, when they're going to re release a press release, they could get so much more mileage out of it by a better understanding of of the biblical text. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, that's what we will discuss. Welcome back to Let the Stone Speak. We're discussing this almost wonderful discovery of an inscription related to Darius the Great, uh, the Persian emperor. Um, uh, who who ruled from, I think the years exactly were 522 to 486, a long period of rule. And we covered in the first part just, you know, how, how this was, how there was a mistake in the reporting of this and how that was fixed. And and um, it's forgiven for the Antiquities Authority for making, making this mistake. And they came forward and that was just wonderful to see. However, I will just take you through part of this press release and then talk a little bit more about this exciting history of Darius because there's so much from the biblical text where he is mentioned uh, specifically a couple of chapters and then two books of the Bible um, specifically are, are, are dated according to Darius's reign. <laughs> so there's so much more mileage uh, that they could have gotten out of this um, if it had been a, 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 a legitimate discovery. Um, this is what uh, one of the Antiquities Authority's people uh, write in uh, the press release. They said, It's amazing that visitors to the site come across such rare inscription reviving the Persian king Darius, known to us from the sources. His son, King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, who ruled from India to Kush, which is what it says in Esther, so that's good, could never have imagined that we would find evidence of his father in Israel 2,500 years after the dramatic events in his royal court. Well, it's not just the story of Esther. It's like you get to the Persian period and everyone's like, Esther, Persian period, Esther. I mean, that is, it's an important, that's one book that was written during the Persian period. Um, this was an important uh, intrigue inside the palace where God was raising up um, a way of protecting the Jewish people throughout the whole empire uh, into Jerusalem as well and elsewhere. I'm not diminishing that. The events in, in Esther take, take place over about 12 years of the Persian period. But there is so much more from this period. And I would, of course, they're trying to link it to Purim, I understand. But how about link it to the biblical text and what this man actually did and how he was actually responsible for issuing a decree that the Jews were able to finish the second temple. That would be a good thing to mention. There would be some good powerful lessons that come from reviving that biblical history instead of just the story of Purim. Of course, Purim is important. I'm not diminishing that. But there's so much more depth and history in the history of the Bible and so many more details that is also borne out by archaeology. We'll talk about another one, another individual, not just Darius, um, 
as we go through a little bit of this history. Now, the p books that are written during the Persian period, off the top of my head, we have uh, Chronicles, uh, First and Second Chronicles, but the more specific ones would be the end of the book of Daniel, you have Esther, you have Ezra, you have Nehemiah, Nehemiah you have Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. These are all written during the Persian period. Now, if you're going to talk about Darius himself, he's mentioned in Ezra chapter 4, Ezra chapter 5 and 6, um, he's mentioned in uh, all through the book of Haggai, all through the book of Zechariah. So we have a biblical figure that would have come up on a potsherd. Now, what did he do? Let's go to, I've got a couple of passages of the Bible of these books that I want to read to you, just so you can get some backstory about who this Darius was. Yes, the artifact turned out to be not real, but this Darius is real. And we have other individuals that are mentioned here. Uh, in Ezra chapter 5 that have been proven as well in archeo through archaeological excavations and discoveries. So let's talk about that. This is Ezra chapter 5 and verse 1, a bit of uh, background here. You had in Ezra chapter 1 detailing the 1 and 2 um, and 3 really, detailing the return of Around 50,000 Jews from Babylon and the surrounding area. This was this took place around 538, 537 um, in this time frame. You'll recall that Jerusalem was destroyed in 586. Uh, and through that time period, you, for 20 plus years before, you had the prophet Jeremiah warning about it, telling them that they would go into captivity. And then several places in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 20, uh, 25, Jeremiah 29, Daniel chapter 9, um, you have reference, and, and the Second Chronicles 36, you have reference to this 70-year period that he talks about and he prophesies about, and God gives him this prophecy actually uh, in Jeremiah 24, that the, the Jews are going to be able to return. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed by the Babylonians, um, but after 70 years from that first, when the first group of deportees are taken away with Daniel and his friends, there'll be 70 years before they'll be able to be return. Not only did he prophesy that, he prophesied about how the, the Babylonian Empire would be demolished after 70 years. Um, and then you can look to the book of Isaiah, which talks about how Cyrus, the Persian first Persian emperor, meaning over, once the Babylonian Empire is destroyed, uh, Cyrus II, that he's going to motivate a return. So he motivates a return. God motivates him. And 50,000 come back. They start to build. Uh, they build the altar first to, to start uh, offering sacrifices to God. Um, and then this is under the leadership of Zerubbabel and, and Joshua, the high priest. Zerubbabel would be the governor of this little area of Yehud um, or Judah. And then you get in uh, after that, you see in chapter two that and chapter three or chapter three, mainly that the, the temple construction stops. They build the foundation. Some that saw the first have tears in their eyes because they realize once they look at the footprint, it's not going to be as glorious as the first one. Um, and then some of them are just overjoyed, crying or shouting for joy because they've started to build it. Now, there's something that happens. Um, in between the construction of the foundation of the temple and then its completion, there is a gap. Work stops. Uh, why exactly it stops? It looks like there's some type of intrigue between probably the Samaritans, the people that are located just above uh, Judah to the north, how they are frustrating their purpose, it says <clears throat> in chapter 4. And so the work stopped for whatever reason, and it stops until the second year of Darius. So this is where we reference Darius in the history. Darius is now the Persian king. He came into power in 522. Um, and then for whatever reason, this is the time that work starts up again. We'll read now Ezra chapter 5 and verse uh, the first two verses. Now the prophets Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God, the God of Israel, prophesied they unto them. And this is the JPS Tanakh from 1917. So you have these two prophets that come on the scene. And this is just amazing. I mean, you have these, these books, um, these scrolls, part of the 12. You have Zachariah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. These are the last three. 
All the rest of the prophets take place before the first temple was destroyed. These last three take place during the construction and after the construction of the second temple. And here you have just like this beautiful snapshot of time. Second year of Darius comes around, uh, work begins, and you have Haggai and Zechariah the prophet there with them. And this, they come and they prophesy to them saying, it's time to build. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, is how I'll pronounce it, and Joshua, the son of Jozadak. And they began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them, the prophets of God helping them. This is the history that could have been, you know, talked about with this false discovery, if you put it that way, of Darius. The immense favor that the Jewish people got, as we'll see, um, first of all, they needed to be corrected by Haggai and Zechariah and saying, what in the world? Why have you stopped building? It's time to build. Build the temple. And the Persian period, like the rest of the uh, rest of um, the, you know, the period of the Judean monarchy and so on, it's, a, it's an example of a, a good leader coming forward, changing the people, that leader going away for some whatever reason, and the people falling away. It just repeats over and over and over again. And for whatever reason, I don't necessarily think Sir Rubber Bell was gone, but there was a problem here where the construction stopped. And so God raised up two prophets, two prophets to motivate them in building. And the main one that did this was Haggai. And this is what it says, Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month. How amazing. Darius, the same Darius that almost came up from Lachish. He's mentioned here. In the first day of the month came the word of the eternal by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Shealtu, who was governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jozadak, who was the high priest. So these two um, powers of, of, of civil authority being Zerubbabel, the position Nehemiah would eventually hold, and then the high priestly line. Um, that in this case is uh, Joshua, one of the sons of Zadok. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts saying, and this is the correction. So this actually takes place before Ezra chapter five and verse two, before they start working. God comes to cor correct them through Haggai and Zechariah. This is what he says. This people say, <laughs> so this is what the people, this is what the people were saying 2,500 years ago in Jerusalem. The time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the eternal by Haggai the prophet. Haggai had something different to say from God. He said, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your sealed houses while the house lie, this house lies waste? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. So basically, people, it got pretty hard to build the temple. And people wanted to go build up their own luxurious houses. And that's what they were doing. They were focused on just what they needed to do. And meanwhile, the temple lies waste, not constructed yet. And he says, consider your ways. You have sown much. This is one of the most beautiful parts of this book, you have sown much and brought in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none warm. And he that earns wages earns wages for a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider that God hasn't blessed you since you stopped doing building the house. Go up to the hill country and bring wood, and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified. So this is the correction that Haggai brings uh, to them. And it's really, it is kind of condemning. You see so many other parts of Ezra and Nehemiah in this history, and how they are trying to do it every way, you know, the way that King David did it. They instituted the singers just after the ordinance of King David. They brought the, they lowered the age of the Levites that could work on the temple back from 30 down to 20, just like King David did if he had to. And so you see this repeated, I think it's five, six, seven times in these books, how they were trying to get back to the way that David did it. And yet here, they weren't doing it the way that David did it. You remember what motivated the actual construction of the temple. It was King David sitting in his beautiful palace built by Hiram, a house of cedars, as he calls it, 
a beautiful house and he's thinking to himself, why is it that I've got this luxurious house and God still dwells in a tent down by the Gihon Spring? There's something wrong about this. I need to fix this. And, you know, he says to Nathan the prophet, I need to fix this. I want to build a a permanent structure, a beautiful structure for God. And Nathan goes and tells him, great idea. But then God tells Nathan, says, go back to David and say, that is a great idea, but I'm not going to let you do it. I'll let Solomon do it. You're a man of war. But that's a great idea. And because of that, I'm going to make you a house, David. I'm going to make you a royal dynasty. That's what house can mean. There's going to be a dynasty that comes from you, the Davidic dynasty. Now, this was David's motivation. And yet you see the opposite here with some of these people. They were dwelling in their luxurious houses, just as David was. And that didn't make them think about the temple that still lies waste. And then we have, you know, Haggai saying, consider your ways. Or God telling him, say, consider your ways. And they did. That's the main point. They did. This was an example of God sending prophets Prophets to these people that were there during the reign of Darius and them responding. Again, Ezra chapter 5. It says, Then rose up Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Joshua the son of Jozadak and began to build the house of God. Build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and with them the prophets of God helping them. Then it says this. It's not always easy. They respond. But it says this, at the same time came to them Tatanay, the governor beyond the river, and Shethabozanay, and their companions, and thus says unto them, Who gave you a decree to build this house and to furnish, finish this structure? So this is just interesting political intrigue. You have the Bible relates. Now, this is the Bible, okay? The Bible, this written, you know, Ezra chapter 5, written during the 5th century BCE, long time ago, 2,500 years ago, writing about history. And he just plucks up this name out of the hat. And I'm saying, I'm going to create this narrative of what happened back then. I'm going to call him Tatanay. He's going to be the governor on this side of the river, the Persian official. And he's going to be the one that tries to serve an injunction on the work of the house of God. If that was the case, why have we found, or I didn't find or you didn't find him, but in Babylon, Babylon, they found one of those cylinders back a hundred years ago almost that has the name Tatne on it. And what is his job? He's the job of, he's got governor on that side of the river speaking about the river being the Euphrates, everything, so this area of Syria and Palestine, uh, if we can call it that, that was governed by this Tatane guy. Now, we know also at the time, other documents bring out that there was a governor that was probably over him, um, that was over Babylon and across the river or beyond the river. That was the official name of the Persian uh, uh, satrapy. Um, Darius himself is actually famous for amazingly um, organizing the Persian Empire into 20 distinct provinces or satrapies. And one of those, one of the big ones, was beyond the river. And we have the Bible saying that at that same time to them, during the second year of Darius, Tatne, the governor beyond the river, he's coming to see what's going on with this building. And we have a discovery related to him. Um, this was, a again, a tablet that was written on June 5th, 502 BCE. So this is about 18 years after the events here in Ezra chapter 5. And yet, this authentic tablet has the name on it, Tatane, um governor of this side of the river. And uh, during the reign of Darius, it mentions Darius on this tablet as well. So you've got this tablet crafted under Darius, mentioned Tatne, mentioning he is the governor on the other side of the river. And then you have something written on that other side of the river, written during the second year of Darius, mentioning the governor of the river of, of this province being Tatne as well. Now, that's beautiful. This is the opportunity that I think the IAA, had it been real, should have focused on. Purim, yes, important. But here we have 
one of the amazing uh, corroborations, I would say, or, or just this bringing back to light of a biblical event that took place of how, how you had the Jews being motivated by Haggai and Zechariah to start building the temple and then them doing it and then the governor coming to say, what in the world are you doing? And then you're going to have this amazing response, which is basically to say, hey, I know you're very important. I know you're the Persian official, governor on this side of the river. But we have higher authority. They say they're the servants of the great God. They use that terminology carefully, I believe, um, to not offend. Um, but then they also say we also have another bit of authority. And that isn't just of Darius, your boss. This is from the boss or the, the originator of the great Persian emperor, Cyrus the Great. Now, what we advise you to do, if it's possible, is can you go and have a look and fact check us? We want you to fact check us. We're, 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 we want to be accurate here. Go back and go and find in the, the role of, of, of the library, let's put it that way, in ancient Babylon and see if you can find the original decree that Cyrus, who was you know alive almost 20 years ago, um, or who was ruling, uh, he was alive less than that as well, but he made the decree almost 20 years ago, that allowed us to come back and build the temple. And so being the good, I think a really good um, uh, officer of the Persian empire, he didn't try and stop them from working at that point. He said, okay, well, I've got to be careful here because once a Persian decree goes out, we can't, we can't overturn that. So he does this tatane, which the Bible mentions, which were found in Babylon on a scroll. Um, he goes and he writes and he says, let search be made. Go find it. See if it's there. See if these Jews are telling the truth. And it wasn't. It was not found in Babylon. It was found in another capital, the summer residence of, of Darius up further uh, in the north. Um, they did discover, though, a roll, a, a, an ancient cylinder that had the original decree of Cyrus on it. And that said that the Jews are indeed are allowed to build this. And so then once you get into Ezra um, chapter 6, basically it's Darius, this same Darius that could have been a uh, discovery here in Israel. He's writing to Tatne, who we know is a historical figure. He's saying, whoa, you just, you just hang tight over there, Mr. Governor. I know you're working hard for me, but do not stop the work going on. Cyrus made a decree that they can build, so let them build. Let them finish. And then actually, you help them build. You provide some wood for that altar. You provide some materials for that building. And then I want you to actually, once it's finished building, out of your pocket, <laughs> out of the revenue that you get from that side of the river, I want you to um, fund some offerings to be made. For me, the Persian emperor at, that, um, at, the, at the altar in Jerusalem. Just an amazing bit of history here that is corroborated outside the Bible during the reign of Darius. So if you want to read up on this, go to the text. It's always best to go straight to the text. Read Ezra chapter 5 and 6. Perhaps before you read Ezra chapter 5, read the book of Haggai and show how God corrected them and said, you know, things aren't going well for you. It's because my house lies waste. Do as David did. Worry about my house. Then all your things are going to be taken care of. And when they did that, when they actually started working, wow, were their houses built up? Was the house finished quicker? Did they have the official backing of the Persian Empire? Yes, they did. It turned out far better than they could have imagined. So this is just one amazing biblical episode, um, I think, that archaeology and history bear out to, to a stunning degree of accuracy and just adds a lot, of, a lot of color to the biblical narrative to see that these individuals were real individuals. And it really does speak to the weight that archaeology uh, can provide to the biblical narrative as well. So please do go ahead and go to the source, read Ezra chapter 5 and 6 to cover more of these details that I skipped. And then also, if you like biblical history and biblical archaeology, this is the magazine for you. Again, Let the Stone Speak, available to you for a free subscription for a year. And then after that, 
you can roll it over for another year for free and then keep on going. It's always going to be for free. We'll never follow up with you uh, about that asking for money. It's a wonderful resource, I would say, for you if you're interested in connecting the Bible with archaeology here in the land of Israel. Thank you very much for listening today, and I'll talk to you next week.